There is no official requirement to report such increased reserves. It's totally voluntary. So this was what brings in domestic mining. China and, and Russia, of course, as well, are able to soak up all of their gold output from domestic sources. They never are required to disclose it, and thus they can accumulate large quantities of gold in a clandestine manner. And so we know China has been doing this since at least the middle of the last decade. I could easily see China having well over 4,000 tons of gold reserves right now. Prepare for shock and awe. Gold, silver, copper, and zinc. This 30 cent a share company could be looking at life-changing gains. Even Resource Capital Inc., a billion dollar private equity fund made up of expert mining analysts and investors, just quietly took an 18% stake in the company. Learn more at crushthestreet.com slash hard assets. Hello, everyone, and welcome in to CrushTheStreet.com. I am Kenneth Amaduri, and I'm joined today with a new guest, and you've probably heard of this man. His name is Jeff Nielsen and is the co-founder and managing partner of Bullion Bulls Canada, and he's a contributing writer for Sprott Money and is covered regularly by some of the biggest blogs in alternative media sites, including Zero Hedge. SGT and the list goes on but we're gonna have a discussion today about silver gold precious metals and what is going on around the world but first of all Jeff thanks for joining me today my pleasure to be here Jeff as you've plainly put it in a recent article there's really no rational way to explain the silver markets and uh, we can go back for decades on this now last week gold saw a fifty dollar smash and uh, silver got slammed down too from the fifteen eighty level now starting with silver you know, is 1580 going to be the highest the cartel will allow this metal to go here in the short term? Well, I've come up with a bit of a <clears throat> theory on this, this current rally we've been seeing, quote unquote, in precious metals. And, and basically, I don't consider it to be a valid rally. And there's one major reason for this, and it's basically the fact that whenever you see precious metals in a legitimate rally, silver always leads the way. And there's a very clear reason for this, and it's, it's the price ratio between the two metals. And, of course, this, the price ratio has been extreme for the last several decades, generally 50 to 1 or greater. So what this means in market terms is that it only requires 1 50th the amount of capital to enter the silver market to push it up equal to the gold market. So, you know, we're talking 2% two, 2 as much capital to push silver up as, as, as it requires to push gold up. And, and, of course, when we look at the physical market, you know, for instance, mint sales, we see silver outselling gold by a 50 to 1 ratio in, in terms of, of the actual metal itself. So, I look at the markets, I see gold leading the way, I see the price ratio currently at 80 to 1. And what it means at 80 to 1 is if only 2% of the money entering the sector was going into silver, silver would have to lead the way higher. It's not leading the way higher. I can't believe there's less than 2% of all the money entering the sector going into silver. So I can't accept this as a legitimate rally. And so when I see the slam down like we saw in gold last week, I just see it as part of, of, a, of a general script where precious metals are being marched higher in this fake rally in anticipation of a general crash, which I, I believe is scheduled for later this spring. You know, uh, wow, that, that's, we, we're definitely gonna talk about that, but I guess my, uh, I guess what people might be thinking about when you're saying silver leading the way, I mean, we are dealing with a global meltdown with the economy, and silver has that industrial component to it that will drag down its movement higher. Um, in this environment uh, do you have any thoughts on that and is is this a reason why we are not seeing silver perform as well as gold I have always considered that to be a totally perverse line of reasoning uh, we, we start off with the fact that gold and silver are precious metals they have aesthetic appeal and in fact silver is the more brilliant of the two metals so if it wasn't more physically plentiful silver would probably have the greater value so they're both metals are precious both metals have aesthetic appeal in addition silver has this 
rapidly growing industrial demand. How can this make silver less valuable? It's still a precious metal, but it also has the industrial component. It makes it even more precious because there are two important streams of demand. And of course, this is what a market's all about, demand, supply and demand. Supply is fixed, demand is increasing because there's still the precious metal demand for silver, the investment demand for silver, and we see the massive industrial demand, and that makes it of course, more valuable, more precious, and, and the exact opposite of what we're told with this line of reasoning. So you talked about precious metals, uh, specifically gold getting slammed later on this year. Can you expand on that a little more as to why you think this is going to happen and what will be the the reason behind the, the next leg down? Well, just a little less than two years ago, I was listening to an interview from a gentleman named Warren Pollack. And uh, he his... Uh, big point he wanted to make in that clip was that he believed that uh, 2015 would be kind of a, a setup year. Uh, we would see markets showing topping behavior in anticipation of the end of a bubble and crash cycle. And he pointed out himself that these cycles tended to be uh, coinciding with the U.S. Uh, election cycle because if you schedule a crash when one party is going out of power, they can be tagged as a scapegoat. The other party gets to ride in as the white knight, and then you repeat the whole cycle again. So, you know, based on that line of reasoning, I've been quite convinced that we have uh, a quote unquote next crash scheduled for this spring to fit the U.S. election cycle. And <clears throat> getting back to precious metals, the point here is that in a crash scenario, uh, the banks do not want gold and silver to be seen as a true safe haven. Because if that was the case, people would rush into physical metals and rush out of the world of paper. And of course, that is very bad for the financial sector. Mm. So there is a, a strong incentive to make sure that whenever the markets go down, that precious metals are hammered as well so that they never appear to be a safe haven. So that when the sheep start to run around in panic during a crash scenario, that, that they don't have this obvious lifeboat presented to them as, as shelter. Jeff, in a recent so, sorry. yeah, you know, in a recent article you wrote, uh, the article was titled Two Worlds of Precious Metals East and West," and you discussed the fraud of government and banks leasing and selling their gold into the markets, and then lying about their actual reserves. I mean, can you give us some insight here on what you were talking about and what has been going on in secrecy for years now? Well, once again, I just refer to what the bankers themselves always tell us. And their favorite line is, quote unquote, gold generates no income. So if you have any asset that generates no income, there could never be a legitimate business purpose for lending it. Because, of course, when you lend something, that it implies you're paying interest on it. And if you're paying interest on something that generates no income, that's a, a losing transaction, uh, prima facie. So, so what legitimate business entities would ever voluntarily choose to enter into losing business transactions. No. There, there aren't any. I mean, that's, that's the opposite point of business. Bus you, people are in business to make a profit. So there's no legitimate business purpose to bullion leasing, leasing yet we know it, it occurs on a massive scale. And, and, and of course, then we can also refer back to Sir Alan Greenspan and his famous quote while he was chairman of the Federal Reserve, we stand ready to lend gold in increasing quantities or sorry, we stand ready to lease gold in increasing quantities should the price rise. Mm. And, and so, you know, we, we just need to go by what the bankers themselves have already put on the record. Gold generates no income, but they're ready to lease it in, in whatever quantities are necessary to kill the price if they see the price start to rise and the canary in the coal mine starts to sink. Wow. Yeah, and they act like it's some sort of sideshow, but in reality, they're fighting it tooth and nail to keep it from, you know, causing people to realize where the true value is and where exactly. the value is not. <laughs> so uh, in the article, you talk about how the central bankers and the governments trash the metal and calling it barbaric and a, a relic. And as you write, you don't hear this coming from the East. And you have a quote in this article that said, he who owns the gold makes the rules. So you suggest, and you know, we know this by the facts, that China is covertly hoarding gold for a reason. Uh, let's get your thoughts on this. Well, of course, China 
made this phenomenal national drive to ramp up its domestic gold mining industry in the early part of the last decade. And it was truly phenomenal. In, in a period of about five years, China tripled its gold output. And I, I don't know how familiar you are personally with, with the mining side of, of the, the business, but of course, uh, taking a mine from initial exploration stage through to production can take as long as 10 years. So to see a, a, a nation which already had a fairly large gold mining industry triple its production in a span of five years it is something I don't think that has ever been witnessed before with regard to precious metals production. So there was obviously a very strong national incentive to ramp up gold production within China. And then, we, of course, we go to the rules with respect to the disclosure of gold reserves. And, and this is something that's, that's not very well understood within the general public or, or even amongst a lot of other commentators. And, and the point here is that uh, with regard to reporting gold reserves, gold is money. And so regard, the rules of money are what apply to gold with regard to reporting reserves. And with regard to the rules of money, nations only have to disclose when they take in new reserves from foreign sources, because then we have money transferring from one jurisdiction to another. That must be reported. That's the rules of money. Conversely, if a nation adds reserves from a domestic source, and so nothing is crossing borders, there is no official requirement to report such increased reserves. It's totally voluntary. So this was what brings in domestic mining. China and, and Russia, of course, as well, are able to soak up all of their gold output from domestic sources. They never are required to disclose it, and thus they can accumulate large quantities of gold in a clandestine manner. And so we know China has been doing this since at least the middle of the last decade. And, uh, of course, we never hear of a single ounce of Chinese gold production leaving that nation. So by my own calculations, just through what China originally had and what it's been able to accumulate through uh, its own domestic mining industry, I could easily see China having well over 4,000 tons of gold reserves right now. Mm. Jeff, so what do you think they're planning on doing? Is this going to be indicative of some sort of change in the monetary system? Is China heading that direction or is it just a hedge against fiat money? Well, as our own monetary system has gotten more and more extreme with its policies, I took a very close look at this from, from a basic theoretical standpoint. And, and the only conclusion I've been able to reach looking at this issue very hard for several years is that any fiat currency system is by definition a Ponzi scheme. There's simply no way for the numbers to add up over the long term. It's a, it's a Ponzi scheme because it's based upon infinitely, an infinitely expanding economy. Mm. And of course, this is a ludicrous premise because we live in a finite system. So you can't have an open-ended, infinite expansion system operating within a finite system because if you do, you're going to have an eventual crash. You know, maybe it's 10 years, maybe it's 20 years, but the point is, the longer you go before the crash occurs, the worse the crash. A fiat currency system leads to inevitable crash scenarios. And, and so, China and Russia, of course, can see this themselves. They're, they're not part of this, this Western financial crime syndicate, and, 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 they, and they're looking for a new way. And of course, they're also looking for a new way because we see this, this, this big bank crime syndicate committing what I call economic terrorism, primarily via currency manipulation. And we've seen it with India, we've seen it with Russia, we've seen it with China. We hear it in the mainstream media, these, these nations are experiencing a quote-unquote currency crisis. Meanwhile, we have all of the Wall Street banks and, and several of the big European banks convicted of serially man manipulating all of the world's currencies going back to at least 2008. Mm. So th this is why I laugh every time I see the words currency crisis in the media because uh, we have this, this cabal of convicted currency manipulators and the mainstream media never, ever points the finger to them when they talk about these so-called currency crises. Jeff, you know, talking about the expanding fiat currency system and how it ultimately implodes, it, it, I, I understand it imploding on a global level where every country is in the fiat currency system and some of them are gonna have to give. But I, I guess I was just pondering this recently. Can individual countries sustain their fiat currency Ponzi scheme by attracting outside capital? It is certainly possible, but the 
problem we face is that, as I'm sure you know, the banks have made a very concerted effort to intertwine everything. And of course, this was deliberate because this is a whole a part of their whole too big to fail extortion scenario. They deliberately interconnect all these financial assets so that everything is locked together domino style. And if one domino falls, they all fall. And so that was the whole premise of too big to fail. You can't allow any one of our dominoes to fall because then they all go down. Mm. And so they've extorted trillions of dollars from our governments based upon that extortion premise. So uh, if if that's been sufficient to, to cause our governments to pay all of this extortion money, presumably uh, they're convinced that, that if one domino goes, they'll all go. Jeff, before we get into mining, I do want to talk about, I wanted to ask you about the markets. Are we going to see a pretty substantial correction here and or even a crash in the markets? Uh, it's difficult to to just to answer a question like that precisely because we don't know uh, the overall magnitude of the crash that's coming. Uh, I suspect it's going to be a very severe crash. I, 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 in fact, I refer to it recently as not simply the, the next crash, but the last crash. I, I don't see any way our, our economies and our governments can come out the other side. They're already on the verge of bankruptcy. And of course, this is the problem with any so-called depression or deflation scenario. In order to survive that trough, you have to have some sort of financial reserve that you can cannibalize to, to survive the downturn. If you don't have anything in reserve, you cannot survive a deflationary crash. So this is why I shake my head when I see all these commentators talking about a quote-unquote deflationary crash coming because our governments have no reserve to endure it. All they can do when, when there's a severe downturn is what they've been doing to a, to a great extent already. Print, print, print. Mm. So uh, I look at any severe downturn scenario as being almost inevitably leading to hyperinflation because we, we, we saw, well, we've seen the U.S. dollar hyperinflated already. I, I regularly project in my, my commentaries the last uh, legitimate picture of the U.S. monetary base and it was a straight line going up. And, and you know that's that's for people that are under, uh, familiar with mathematics. That's a uh, exponential function, and, and it's an out of control exponential function. Once the line goes vertical, that's the mathematical definition of out of control. U.S. money printing was already out of control, and of course, when something's out of control, it implies it can never be brought back under control. So when we saw this, the newer charts of the U.S. monetary base where supposedly the money printing is leveled off, I just laugh at that because it's obviously fraudulent. It's mathematically impossible to level off after going fully exponential. Mm. When you go full ex fully exponential, the only final outcome that is possible is implosion or explosion. You either withdraw the money printing and you implode, or you keep going full tilt and sooner or later you explode. Those are the only mathematical possibilities. Tapering was never mathematically possible, therefore tapering never occurred. Jeff, so uh, that, that's powerful stuff right there. Uh, so talking about gold, right before we get into mining, I wanted just to ask you, do you think we're going to see new lows with gold? And if we do, how will this affect the mining sector, which has, for what we can tell, led us into this uptrend or this uptick in the precious metal sector? I, I simply marvel at the survival capabilities of these mining companies. Uh, they've been on the receiving end of all of this precious metals manipulation over the last quarter century or so in particular and of course they always get the worst of it because uh, I'm sure as you and your listeners know the, the mining companies leverage metals prices and it's a natural reality of their production model. You produce an ounce of gold at say $800 an ounce, you sell it at $1,000 an ounce, that's a $200 profit. If the price of gold goes up $100 an ounce, uh, for everybody else that's just a 10% gain but for your uh, mining company, it makes you 50% more profitable. Mm. <laughs> so you become 50% more profitable with that $100 an ounce gain in the price of gold. And of course, that is supposed to translate into uh, 
increased leverage in the share price. And of course, we generally haven't seen that over the last decade because the mining companies are themselves uh, extreme targets of, of price suppression. Because, again, just like I was speaking before about how in a, in a rally we're supposed to see silver lead gold, in a legitimate rally we're supposed to see the miners lead bullion because of this natural leverage in their business model. And, and so we're seeing that to some extent this time. But of course, we have to take that in context, the mining share prices were pushed to such an absolute ridiculous low mm -hmm. versus any other asset class in the entire world of investment that it was inevitable that they would they would have a, a you know a, a leap higher as soon as there was the slightest bit of life in this sector. So I, I certainly think it's possible we could see new lows in metal prices going forward and if that happens, of course the mining companies will once again take the brunt. But you know, like I say, they, they've shown this remarkable capacity to survive these these uh, meltdowns and, and, and over even an extended duration, as we've seen over the past five years. So I suspect that having been burned so many times with, with these reversals in, in the marketplace, that very few of these companies will extend themselves to the point that they will get... Uh, hammered by the, sh the near term crash that I think is coming. I don't think they'll have time to ramp up their operations enough to, to really get hammered by this reversal that I expect to occur. Wow. Yeah, no, that's definitely on the table. And we've seen that happen time and time again. Although I, I got to say, something feels different about this turnaround that we're seeing in the precious metals market. Is there seems to be a lot more optimism among investors which is a big aspect to the companies being able to operate well and and do the things that they do and uh, move forward with their projects so i i'm almost wondering too if we do see a reversal if we'll have a stronger shareholder base across the board because maybe that optimism will they'll hold on a little more because people have seen these you know 50 percent returns 100 percent returns and know that the the uptick is around the corner well what really concerns me in scenarios like this is the way that the general investment public has been conditioned or even brainwashed. And and I don't really think we even have investors any longer in the marketplace. I, I refer to the people who we call investors as momentum chasing idiots. Because this is what we've been programmed to do. We no longer look to buy low and sell high. We no longer look for the cheapest assets to move into and then wait for them to appreciate in value. That's investing. Instead, what we see over and over again are people simply looking for the hottest market. They leap into it after it's already risen, uh, you know, often considerably. And so it's no longer buy low, sell high, which is the motto of investing. It's buy high and try to sell higher. And, of course, that's, that's the way you lose money in markets. Mm -hmm. But it also, the problem with, with having a momentum-based investment public is that the moment the momentum changes, they, they flee. So uh, I do believe that there's a lot of strong hands in the sector, especially with regard to the longer term holders of bullion and the longer term holders of the mining shares. But with respect to the newcomers, uh, these are, uh, tend to be uh, very fickle investors who could uh, very easily jump off the bandwagon. Jeff, thank you again for coming on the show with me. Uh, in this short 20 minute interview here, you've were able to share with us hours and hours of information and research that you do on a regular basis. So again, thank you so much for your time and sharing the knowledge with us. If people want to learn more about you and follow your work on a regular basis, where would they go and what would they find? Uh, my site is bullionbullscanada.com and it's been in operation since the beginning of 2009. I, I published roughly 1,200 commentaries on that site. And of course, as you mentioned earlier, graciously, I also contribute to, to Sprott Money. Uh, it's a, an investment company up in Canada, which is committed to bullion more than uh, probably any other financial company you'll see. And uh, they are also very supportive of, of of alternative perspectives, which is something you very rarely see from mainstream financial institutions. Yep. And as you also mentioned, my work's seen uh, at, at numerous other alternative media sites. And uh, with regard to what I'm involved in currently, it's mostly just uh, trying to stay on top of this, this general paradigm I see of, of this next crash coming and, and presenting the clues to readers as we see them and, and, and trying to refine 
my call here as much as possible. So, you know, originally I was saying, well, it could be any time in the first half of 2016. But, of course, you know, we we're already into March now. So, you know, very clearly I'm seeing this coming for, for late in the spring, and, and that's what I'm focused on at this point. Mm -hmm. Jeff Nielsen, everyone of Bullion Bulls Canada, thank you so much, Jeff, for coming on the show with me today and sharing your insight. My pleasure to be here, and I'd be happy to come back anytime.